In today's episode, giant batteries made of sand, a clear answer to whether insects feel pain, and the first evidence of cultural exchange in Wales. The first was on this day in 1938 that Howard Hughes flew around the world in just 19 hours. In the grip of a ferocious heat wave across much of Europe. June temperature records have been tumbling from the Arctic Circle right the way down to North Africa, and temperatures are well above where they should be. Europe is sweltering under one of its earliest and hottest heat waves on record. Scientists say climate change is driving unseasonably high temperatures. The ferocious heat waves cause temperatures to rise well above the June average for many countries, in some cases by as much as 20 degrees. Norway recorded a temperature of 32.5 degrees Celsius, reportedly the highest temperature ever recorded within the Arctic Circle in Europe, and significantly higher than the June average of 13. Poland saw temperatures reach the mid-30s, and in part, Spain reached temperatures above 40 degrees. According to new research, an expansion of a pressure system is driving these unprecedented changes. Known as the Azores High, it's a pressure system that lies above the Portuguese islands in the North Atlantic and has a huge impact on weather in Europe all year round. Carolina Rumenhofer is a physical oceanographer and shared her knowledge of these systems on DW News. The size and position of the Azores High can steer the path of rain-bearing weather systems from the North Atlantic onto Europe during winter time. And for example, the uh, Iberian Peninsula receives large portions of its annual winter rainfall um, during that time. And when the Azores High is unusually large during winter, it essentially blocks the passage of rain-bearing weather systems and drier conditions result. And this is the impact we're seeing now. We've looked at um, the size of the Azores High over time, how that has been changing in um, instrumental data, so uh, station data that was taken uh, across metrological stations all over Europe over the last 150 years or so. And we found that over the past century, the number of extremely large Azores high events during winter time has increased significantly. Since 1980, it's actually two to three, three times more likely to have such an extremely large Azores high during winter than in the previous 100 years. At no time during the last 1,200 years did we see that many uh, extremely large Azores high. And so uh, that's a pretty significant change to previous conditions. And as you may have guessed, researchers think these changes are due to human activity. So the climate model simulations allow us to actually tease apart different factors and how they've contributed to changes in the Azores high. So we have a series of simulations, um, some that just isolate the effect of natural variability, for example, volcanic eruptions or the effect of solar variability or the effect of greenhouse gases. And what we've seen when we compare the um, number of extremely high Azores, extremely large Azores high events during winter time, that only those simulations that contain anthropogenic greenhouse gases mm -hmm show this rapid rise that we've observed in the last 100 years. So the climate model simulations indicate that natural variability cannot explain this increase in uh, the number of winters with extremely large Azores high, but greenhouse gases can. think of energy solutions, you might not imagine a hundred tons of builder sand piled inside a huge silo. But one company has actually found that sand can be the secret source to energy storage, as it can store heat for months. The world's first fully working sand battery has now been installed in Finland. It can store sustainably produced heat for months at a time and could be used to keep homes warm in winter. Tommy Aronen is one of the battery's developers and explained the technology to BBC News. We are heating the uh, sand battery with uh, clean electricity and then storing the heat there and taking up the, for usage uh, later on. Transfer that to time that it's uh, more useful. 
It works by charging 100 tons of sand with heat generated by solar or wind-powered energy. Electricity from these sources is converted into heat, which warms the sand up to 500 degrees Celsius. Crucially, the sand can keep this heat without loss for months. Heat's the biggest end use for energy all over the world. It's also critically important for survival in a country like Finland, where the winter is long, cold and dark. And whilst it might seem like a bit of a left-field idea, sand has got its supporters, like Pekka Passi, managing director of the Vatajanovsky power plant. It's a bit strange, but it's, it's cheap, it's easy to get, and, uh, and you can get to really high temperatures, maybe 500 degrees, uh, while in, with water you can only get to 100 so you get a lot of heat stored in a you know small small space. Finland now hopes to expand their sand system, making it a thousand times bigger. The researchers hope the world can quickly benefit before the sands of time run out for fossil fuels. Still to come on the Sunday Seven, a potential exercise pill and an answer to whether insects feel pain. The question of whether or not insects feel pain has long been a matter of heated debate among scientists. In a study published this week, a team of researchers argue these animals have a certain biological mechanism that indicates they may indeed have a subjective experience of pain. So my name is Lars Chetka and I'm a professor of sensory and behavioural ecology at Queen Mary University of London. I'm also an author. I have a book coming out entitled The Mind of a Bee later this month. And that's also what my research is about. I study the intelligence, the learning and memory, and the communication of bees. Lars is one of the authors of the paper, and we caught up with him to get a better understanding of what this new research means. Our first question is perhaps an obvious one. How on earth do you assess pain in an insect? It's not easy, uh, as I guess is implied with your question. So there is no formal proof to measure anyone's pain, and that makes it all the more difficult in animals, especially insects who don't wince or grimace or anything like that. What one can measure, of course, are neural responses, responses from the brain, hormonal responses and also behavioral responses to stimuli that are potentially or actually hurting the animal. And whilst it's widely accepted that pretty much all animals have nociception, which is a reflex-like response to dangerous stimuli, that doesn't necessarily equal pain. And so in this sense, it's interesting to ask and to observe whether the animal has flexibility to respond according to context to such adverse stimuli. And that, as opposed to basic nociception, this reflex-like response, is a hallmark of pain in humans, for example. So this might look like suppressing pain. Soldiers, for example, sometimes aren't aware of their serious injuries until they get back safely and suddenly they start really hurting. What happens there is that our inbuilt opiate systems dampen the pain so that you can get back to safety. You can also actively suppress pain when, for example, you want to cast yourself as a hero or heroine or there's some price to be won, then you can, of course, suppress the pain and bear it and grit your teeth and go through with your actions anyway. And this kind of flexibility is controlled by the brain. And thus, if you find that there are controls from the brain that allow you to modulate your response to potentially harmful stimuli, that's an indication that there is actually something like a pain sensation in an animal as well. And that's what Lars and his co-authors looked at in this study. An animal's response to these harmful stimuli can sometimes be dampened according to context or increased. One example is the uh, tobacco hornworm, a caterpillar that strikes in a kind of snake-like manner at potentially harmful stimulus, such as in nature, the attack of a bird. And it strikes basically at the source of the, the, the stimulus. And this is not just a reflex, but increases gradually with repeated attacks. And in nature, this has the effect sometimes of the bird thinking that it's being attacked by a snake and then withdrawing and giving the caterpillar time to, to escape. So this is the kind of flexibility that I'm talking about that is indicative of not just a reflex, 
but something that is more plastic and allows the behavior to respond adaptively according to context. Like what happens when we experience pain? In other cases, there's a dampening response with repeated stimulation, which indicated an animal can downregulate their pain response. Lars also explained that there's evidence of chronic pain in insects like fruit flies. Even if the injury has already healed, there is still an increased response to noxious or potentially painful stimuli, indicating that there's some sort of long-term modulation of pain in analogy with human uh, chronic pain. That's the behavioural responses and the neural mechanisms which allow this to happen are significant for Lars's research too. So with all of this, we may want to reconsider how we interact with insects. For researchers like Lars, this could mean reassessing how insects are used in the lab. There's no need to explain the potential benefits of your research or the severity of the treatment, nor do you have to explain what you're doing to minimise suffering and so on. I think that needs re-evaluation for us who are working on insects. And in the real world, for the past few years, people have started to look towards insects to feed our growing and hungry populations. Whilst this idea is not necessarily a bad one, it does also raise some ethical questions. One other factor in this uh, growing trend is that there is a kind of sense that with insects there are also no ethical concerns. and that that makes them a more attractive type of animal to breed than cattle or chickens and so on. And I think, again, this needs re-evaluation. It might be that there is less to be concerned about, but I think at this stage we have enough of a doubt to want to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes as in chicken battery farming decades ago and so on. Whilst there's loads more work to be done, you might want to keep this research in the back of your mind the next time you reach for that fly swatter. Ever feel like you're on a treadmill going nowhere fast when it comes to exercise? Well, you're doing your body good. It's all about the molecules. Exercise alters more than 9,800 molecules in your blood, a process that scientists have called a cellular symphony. And there's one molecule in particular which gained the attention of Stanford scientists. For many of us, we know that exercise is good for you. But it's remarkable how little we know about the basic science of why exercise is good for you. That's Jonathan Long, PhD. He's an assistant professor of pathology at Stanford. And what we found is a molecule, it's circulating in blood, and it's called LACV. What we've been able to show is that this LACV molecule is one of the most dramatically induced after intense physical exercise. And what it does is it goes to your brain to suppress feeding and obesity. So how did they carry out this research? Originally, we were studying mice on treadmills, and so we decided to look at a second model of exercise. For this, we picked racehorses. They can exercise harder than any other mammal. We get all of these tubes labeled California Racehorse and Board coming here in the lab, and it turns out that, lo and behold, the LACV molecule shows up at the top of the list once again. And it turns out that when we started to exercise humans, the same thing happened. Researchers took samples from humans who'd done resistance sprint and endurance training, and it turns out that the harder you go, the more molecules you produce. To see if this molecule in particular could be responsible for imparting some of exercise's miraculous effects on health, researchers injected obese mice with LACV and found it significantly lowered their appetite, reduced body fat and improved glucose tolerance over the 10-day study period. Researchers are now keen to understand the molecule's potential medical applications. We need to understand how it's working in the brain, what are the receptors that are engaged by LACV, and once we work out those pathways, then we can think about how do we now start to develop medicines so that you can maybe take a pill to help you in your weight loss journey. Still to come on the Sunday 7, giant snails and singing whales. Right after this. You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso, or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. The sound of humpback whales singing. The noises may sound random, but the grunts and howls you hear there are actually working in a sequence, and the same complex sequences are being passed around whale groups from region to region. Dr Jenny Allen from the University of Queensland leads the research. 
you could you could separate happy birthday into chunks, right? And the, the same is true of Humpback Whale Song. You can separate it into kind of four to seven chunks. And if the two populations are singing the same chunk, it's indistinguishable. She thinks the songs are being learned by whales on shared migration routes. This study strongly supports that because they're learning, they're learning parts of the song that they couldn't learn unless they're physically getting really close together. Rochelle Constantine is a marine biology professor from the University of Auckland and weighed in on this research for New Zealand's One News. So um, the song has very low frequency sounds, it's super low. Those can travel over several kilometres, even you know, tens of kilometres. The very high frequency sounds, the little chirps and whistles kinds of sounds, those are much closer. This indicates a level of cultural transmission Neve's never seen before in a non-human species, and there's hope the finding can lead to greater conservation efforts to protect these magnificent mammals. Paving the way for future moon exploration missions, the European Space Agency has been testing its lunar rovers on Mount Etna in Sicily, Italy. Its rocky volcanic surface makes it an excellent substitute for the lunar surface. As part of the Space Agency's Autonomous Robotic Networks to Help Modern Societies, or ARCHES program as we probably should call it, these trials are testing the technology required to operate rovers remotely on the moon. Traditionally, the rovers are operated from the Earth. With the lunar gateway being put in place around the Moon, there's the possibility of controlling them directly with much smaller time delay. Uh, and this opens up for uh, new possibilities for things that you simply cannot do or is much more difficult to do from the Earth. That was Programme Manager Chettle Worm speaking with new scientists. Working alongside him is Thomas Kruger, head of the Human Robot Interaction Lab at the European Space Research and Technology Centre. For our robots, we really focus on teleoperation. But we go a step further. We use haptic controllers to move our robots, especially move robotics, uh, robotic arms. So if you move our haptic device and the robot touches an obstacle, you indeed feel, feel the touch. And this allows the operator to do more fine-grained tasks that is not possible without haptic feedback. Well, astronaut time is extremely valuable, so you can send a rover to the surface, you can let the ground team do all their planning, uh, let the, them do all the longer traverses, and you get the astronaut involved when it's necessary for maybe the more complex task or the th things where he really, uh, direct teleoperation, direct control of the robot is more helpful. This is one of the first times that the European Space Agency has put a robot into a harsh atmosphere as they have done on Mount Etna. So it's moon-like, we have a complex scenario with the operation centre in the background, the astronaut with time delay in the control centre, and indeed a task that was not known to the scientists and to the astronaut beforehand. We really tried to get as close as possible to real scenarios with surprises. If we master this, we are really confident that these technologies can be yeah, developed further to make it space great to indeed be part of the next moon mission. Here's a new scenario for your library of nightmares. Giant snails that can grow up to the size of a rat have been reported in a town in Florida. The invasive species native to Africa damage plants and soil and can also pose a serious health risk to humans. On June the 23rd, 2022, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services confirmed the detection of the giant African land snail in the Newport Ritchie area of Pasco County. And one day later, the entire area was quarantined. These snails will eat 500 different plants, including virtually everything we grow in the state of Florida as a source of food. That was Mark Fagan from Florida's Department of Agriculture talking to CNN about a similar snail problem back in 2013. Not only can this invasive species munch through any vegetation Florida has to offer, they also carry a deadly parasite that causes meningitis in humans. 
There is a rare form of meningitis that can be picked up by handling these snails if the snail itself is infected. Not every snail will be infected, uh, but an infected snail can pass on this meningitis. And they can breed like you wouldn't believe. They can lay 1,200 eggs in a single year. Back in the 60s, it took 10 years and $1 million to eradicate an infestation of these snails brought in from Hawaii. Our preferred method of control is biological, finding a natural predator. These snails have no natural predator other than us. Only time will tell how the Sunshine State will deal with this latest wave of snail infestation, but at least I suppose they can't run this away. This has been quickly. the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Written, produced and published by Daft Doris.